Hello and welcome back to Mind Over Chatter, the Cambridge University podcast. I'm James. I'm Nick. And I'm Annie. And once again, we're inviting you to join us in our conversations with clever, curious people here in Cambridge. In this third series, we're talking about health. And in this episode, we're focusing on infectious diseases. We're going to cover everything from the consequences of widespread antimicrobial resistance, what happens if there's another pandemic in, say, 10 years' time, the effect of climate change on infectious diseases, and Tinder for bacteria. So, who are we talking to in this episode? An infectious disease epidemiologist. Hi, I'm Caroline Chosser, an infectious disease epidemiologist and expert in bacterial meningitis. I'm also a director of Cambridge Africa. A molecular microbiologist. I'm Stephen Baker. I'm a microbiologist in the Department of Medicine at the University of Cambridge. And a virologist. Hi, I'm Ian Goodfellow. I'm a virologist based in the Department of Pathology at the University of Cambridge. As usual, we began by asking our guests to tell us about their research. So our research focuses on studying gastroenteritis, uh, specifically noroviruses, but we're also interested in using viral genome sequencing as part of epidemic response. So my research focuses on the epidemiology and control of bacterial meningitis um, all around the world. My research focuses on bacteria, how they become resistant to antibiotics, how they respond to antibiotics, and how we can find new solutions to antibiotics. We're going to be talking about infectious diseases and antimicrobial resistance, two complicated topics wrapped into one episode. So we thought we'd start with some definitions. Steve, I'm gonna throw this one to you. Let's start with antimicrobial resistance. First of all, what are antimicrobials and what does it mean for something to be resistant to antimicrobials? Okay, so an antimicrobial and the word antibiotic are kind of interchangeable. Um, They're technically not the same, but for the purposes, they are the same. Uh, And antimicrobials are small chemicals that kill um microorganisms uh, and we've been using them for the last 60 70 years and we use them therapeutically and for other purposes um, the problem then is that bacteria as part of a kind of natural evolutionary process become resistant to these things which means that chemicals that are designed to kill them uh, no longer kill them which means that they survive and then we have a big problem, which means then we try and treat infections with these particular drugs that we've used for some time and the infections don't get better. Can I ask Steve, what is it about these antimicrobials, which means that they kill bacteria? Yeah, so lots of things will kill bacteria. Um, There was a a very famous uh, recent president of the United States that claimed that um, that, that having injecting bleach that may have some impact on coronavirus. That, that's certainly true. But the problem is injecting bleach will also have a problem on your own cells. What they are are very specific and quite elegant chemicals that interact with processes that only occur inside bacterial cells. So we take these chemicals. They, they do have a limited effect on us. Some of them are, to- some of them are more toxic than others. But they they are actually designed uh, to actually stop a process or prevent a process or interact with things that are only found in bacterial cells, which is why um, they they just kill bacteria and don't really have a great impact on us. People maybe forget when you think about antimicrobials is you know many of these are a lot of them are natural things. So you know other microorganisms generate them, and you know the first one. Uh, penicillin was from a fungus and it, it makes this to sort of outcompete, kill off everything else around it so it can survive. So, you know, they they are, many of them are natural chemicals that exist in in, in the wild. Um, and actually, if we did a better job of trying to find them, I think we'd find some really interesting antimicrobials that c- could be really useful. Well that, well, that goes into the definition of what they are. So an antibiotic means anti-life, and an antibiotic is a naturally occurring chemical that produced by other organisms to kill other things, and that's how we first identified them. An antimicrobial is really anything that kills bacteria, and that can be naturally occurring or, or man-made. Um, but yeah, they, a lot of them originate from nature. Some of them are designed and manufactured, but a lot of them originate from nature. So bacteria are naturally evolved, naturally involved to interact with them over millions of years. I mean, so these things have been around for a long time and bacteria therefore have existing mechanisms because they try and avoid being killed by other things. Can we sort of talk a little bit about like 
the how they sort of become resistant a bit more to drugs like the process of it how does that work so so um so so first of all i think that there's there's so if, if you're a bacteriologist such as me that we've been working on amr forever right this is this is this is nothing new um it, it's gathered a lot of political steam over the last few years which is kind of good um and now a lot of people are now working on amr because of it which is also good um so what what happens is then that over a period of exposure and we can do it in a laboratory it's an undergraduate experiment you can take small amounts of a particular chemical that's designed to kill a bacteria you grow the bacteria in the presence of that chemical and then over a period of time you will naturally develop organisms in that mixture that will then be able to respond in some way even if it's a limited way to not have such an effect of that drug on the cell if you then select those bacteria and then keep on doing the same thing and increasing the concentration of the drug you can then stimulate relatively high level resistance that's one way of doing it the other way of doing it is that in us believe it or not many bacteria have sex even though everyone says they don't have sex bacteria do have sex and they exchange genetic information and we can get resistant organisms on ourselves or in our hospitals or other things if we then come in contact with those ba bacteria that have resistance genes they can be then transferred to other bacteria making them immediately resistant to that antibiotic as well so they can either naturally evolve or they can then acquire genetic uh, genetic information so Steve, what, what are the consequences of, of widespread resistance? I mean, my research is on meningitis, and in the absence of antibiotics, uh, meningococcal meningitis will probably be fatal in 70% of cases. Uh, currently, we're down to about 5%, but you know, that, that's one example. Yeah. What are other e examples? There's lots of different things, and, it, and it's a spectrum. So a really good example, when I, when, if, if you're unfortunate to have to listen to one of my talks, is a really good, a really good example that I give is I show a picture of a slide of uh, a, ba a bacteria um, that has different profiles against different antimicrobials. You can measure this on, in a laboratory. You put the chemical on the plate and then you measure a zone around it. And the reason I have an intricate understanding of it is because it was my bacteria. And I was ill. Um, I was quite ill with it for a couple, couple of weeks and I went to see various clinicians. This is when I was living in Asia. And I got treated with three different antibiotics over the course of two weeks until actually then they gave me a swab and actually isolated from it and then measured what it was resistant to. And actually, it was, it was a Staphylococcus aureus. It was resistant to all manner of things. And they gave me one drug, which I could then go and buy in one specific pharmacy and take orally. It was susceptible, i.e. other antimicrobials would kill it, to other antibiotics, but they were all injectable. So if that drug I was given didn't work, then I was going to hospital to have injectable antimicrobials. So it's not just the fact that they're resistant to everything, it's then resistant to antimicrobials that you can either access broadly or you don't have to get hospitalized for. So it depends on the infection and it depends on the scale of, 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 um, uh, of the resistance to particular drugs. For things like typhoid fever, which I work on, then we are in the same position in Pakistan. We have what we call XDR, extended drug resistant typhoid, and that is resistant to every, all but one oral antimicrobial, which, and that, has a 20% mortality rate without antibiotics. So that's the kind of position that we're in. And typhoid is one example for lots of other things. We already have loads of untreated infections in Asia, and we even see them in the UK. But typhoid is quite a good example because there are other ways of dealing with typhoid. Um, it's had better sanitation, you have less typhoid. If you, you can use vaccines, actually. I'm really interested in using vaccines to prevent disease in the first place. And if, if you haven't got the infection, you don't need the antibiotics to treat it. So typhoid is quite a nice example of um, other things that can be done. There's been some big trials published recently showing the typhoid, new typhoid vaccines work really well. Well, this is where the three of us overlap really well because Ian's interested in all things too. <laughs> Caroline's interested in vaccines and I'm interested in kind of, you know, typhoid fever. So yeah, so one big challenge is sanitation. But as Ian will tell you, there's fairly big problems with how we deliver sanitation and how we scale that up. And as Caroline will tell you, vaccines work very well but they don't work well for everything all the time and again there's a also a problem with how you introduce those and how you maintain that consistent supply of vaccination and then how we monitor that to make sure it continues to work because as in the vaccines that caroline works on then they do have to be reformulated at a fairly regular interval to make sure they cover the new organisms as they arise 
Steve, I mean, from, I'm a virologist, so, you know, a AMR, it depends on how you define it, but... It, it, well, I mean, I, I am, it's, it's important in, it's important in, in, in viruses as well. Absolutely, but, it, you know, I would say antimicrobial resistance, for me, is probably the greatest threat to human health. You know, and I think it's a massive underestimation of the impact of it. You know, I think about the minor infections that we get, that we can treat, you know, you can go and buy antibiotic creams and things like that. Maybe not so much in this country, but in other countries you can. And you can, you know, you get in a cut and you treat it and it goes away. Without that ability, you'll end up having to go to hospital. You know, bits of you start to get chopped off. I, I mean, I think we really underestimate the impact that antibiotics have had. I mean, you know, if you go back to the First World War and places like that, people were getting bits of them chopped off left, right and centre because they just couldn't get rid of, rid of infection. So I think it's a major, the biggest risk is, to, as far as I can see, is not some new virus coming along, much as, you know, COVID's terrible. I think the, the biggest risk is a general increase in antimicrobial resistance to common, you know, bacteria that we encounter regularly. So anyone who's immunocompromised, you know, they're going to come down with all kinds of things and we can treat that now, but... We won't at some time in the future. Any sense of both the scale of um, ill health, which is caused by either lack of access to antibiotics or antibiotic resistant bacteria, um, and therefore maybe the threat that Ian was describing of increased antibacterial resistance of these various bacteria which are causing all of this ill health. Yeah, I think we do. I think we have a good grasp on how much resistance is out there and how much disease it causes. I think what we don't have a good grasp on, because of the way things are recorded and tracked through hospital systems, particularly overseas, is exactly how much mortality and morbidity, so how much disease and death is associated with drug resistance. I think there are um, studies that have been done, a lot of studies that have been done using extrapolation and mathematical models but I think for, for, for real kind of clinical primary data, that's still something that we struggle to get because it's really hard to determine whether someone has died specifically because they're infected with an antimicrobial resistant organism. So that, that's the problem. So we don't have a really good kind of control of understanding what that, what that means. When it comes to some of the individual diseases which you guys might look at, do you have a sense in those, um, in those contexts? So Caroline, for example, with meningitis, do you have a, of a sense when looking at just that one disease? Yes. I mean, fortunately for most forms of meningitis, uh, antimicrobial resistance isn't a big problem currently. Um, but that's not to say that it, it couldn't be in the future. Um, and I think, I think maybe that's one thing that's common to infectious disease. We, we potentially underestimate these risks. I mean, the consequences of not having any um, working antimicrobial drug is, is catastrophic. And I think we've seen with the pandemic as well that, that underestimating people underestimate the value of early action which means you have to take much more drastic action later on um and so you know i, I wonder is it are we already, has the horse already bolted steve what, what can we be doing about amr now i mean it's yeah it's a, i mean yeah it's a great question so so for the stuff that i work on so organisms that live in your gut bacteria that live in your gut um in asia yeah i mean I mean, to be honest, it sounds a bit bleak, but antimicrobials are a done deal. They were a done deal 10 years ago. Um, you know, you could, some of the stuff that, some of the stuff that I did when I was working there is, is terrifying. I mean, you can, you can go out into community and you can, you can take, take um, stool samples from kids in the community without an infection and rub them across a plate and 90% of them are resistant to all the antimicrobials you would use in a hospital. So, so it's not, yeah, I think this is the magnitude of the problem. We, we, this is also worth kind of, disgusting a little bit because we get kind of pseudo assessed with tr chasing pathogens that are resistant and what that means but actually we're kind of ignoring the elephant in the room and the elephant in the room is how much biomass there is out there of just drug resistance genes circulating ready to jump anywhere and we just see the tip of the iceberg of it which is people coming to hospital with these infections that we can't treat but actually they're everywhere the, the horse the horse bolted some time ago and we're not going to catch up um so yeah, we really need to start thinking about how we come up with new solutions, because I think that 
if we're reliant on the current technology that we've got, then we're not going to go very far. I was just going to ask a question about, you know, overuse of antibiotics, even in populations where you've got a whole truckload of antimicrobial resistance. The overuse of antibiotics inevitably has a major impact on the microbiome. So, you know, the, the population of bacteria that might, might live in somebody's intestine. And we know now that actually that diversity, so the, that community of bacteria that live in the intestine is really important for just for pretty much everything, you know, for nutritional status, um, it's been linked to, you know, response to vaccines, all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, AMR has a, where people have widespread access to these antibiotics, sure, the, the microbial communities that exist in the intestines of these people have got to be quite different, no? Yeah, yeah, it is. And we've done some of this. So, so, so there's a, a process um, where we can look at the microbiome. So we can take poo samples from people, pull out all the bits of DNA from it and sequence it, and then work out what bacteria are living in your gut. Um, and what we find, yeah, as, a, as I suggested earlier, there's loads of resistance genes. I mean, they're all over the place. Uh, but also people in these places have a kind of different structure. So you'll, you, you'll, your microbiome actually never really recovers back to baseline if you've received an antibiotic. So you leave a kind of scar in the organisms that are in your gut. It never quite gets back to the way it was before because the way antibiotic, antibiotics work, they're, they're very sophisticated chemicals, but they don't work in a very sophisticated manner. They kind of, they will... They will have a go at anything that is susceptible or not susceptible to them. To be honest, that all bacteria will interact with them, which means that it should, then it will either kill them or the bacteria will have to respond and do something. Which means then it has a fairly dramatic impact on your microbiome. So eat all of us when we go to the hospital, or doctors, and take an antibiotic here, we take it orally. That will then have a massive impact on the organisms that live in our gut. Because it's just a sort of let me get this right. It's sort of a blanket. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an it's an atomic bomb. And we don't we don't really have a full picture yet of the of how important the microbiome is we just know it is important but more and more studies are you know coming out showing all kinds of links to obesity and you know you do wonder about the long-term effects of having you know early in life exposure to lots and lots of antibiotic treatments to treat like repeated cases of gastroenteritis what is how does that impact on vaccine take um for you know 10 15 20 years down the line because these individuals have a different microbiome so the bacteria that live in their intestine are completely different than they would otherwise be well Carol, Carol, yeah caroline this is your area a bit isn't it i mean what about what about the impact of microbiome variation on vaccines yeah I, I, to be honest um i need to go and uh, look it up <laughs> read up on that a bit more um but I, i'm thinking you know isn't it a matter of judicial judicious use of antimicrobials so is talking about the effects on the microbiome, um, but the alternative is you, you know, you don't survive beyond <laughs> your, your initial infection. Um, so you know, there's got to be a balance of of, of using them uh, when they're needed to save lives, um, but but taking care of them uh, so that they work longer into the future. I guess. Is this a problem? And I'll say, is it a problem of something that's sort of like been seen as a future problem? That's something that's been kicked further and further down the road how long have we known this has been a sort of issue in a context of research and a population level i wrote my forever i wrote my undergraduate dissertation on on this uh, a long time ago so the 19th then at least the 1950s yep. <laughs> can, can i maybe <laughs> ask a related question which is that um have we misused antibiotics have we exacerbated this problem so Although we might have been able to see it coming, have we done something wrong or is it just an inevitable side effect of the fact that we've utilised antibiotics? And, and does, does knowing this help us solve the problem in any way? Isn't it a bit of both, really? I mean, I think the bottom line is when somebody turns up to the doctor here, you know, in the UK, to the GP, they, they frequently get frustrated if they get turned away and said, look, you know, you're going to get better eventually if, you don't, if they're not given something. Um, but I, I, yeah, for me, I think personally, it's a bit of a combination of both. I think it, this would happen eventually, but we probably brought it forward. And, and I'm speaking here as a virologist who doesn't study these things. Steve and Caroline are much better place to comment on it. I mean, it's inevitable. Resistance is inevitable, so it's going to happen. So if you try and kill, if you try and kill bacteria with, with drugs, 
they become resistant to them eventually. But what we've kind of done is, I mean, to be honest, we've, I mean, we've gone for it. The humanity has gone for it with antimicrobials in the last 50 years. I mean, we really have gone for it. So, so we went through a process of fairly kind of rich investment into identifying new antimicrobial agents. And as soon as they came out, then we'd use them very, very quickly. There's not a single example of an antimicrobial that's been introduced and resistance not been reported within, you know, two years of that drug being licensed and used. There isn't one. So, so, and the more they get used, the more resistance we, we, we generate. So, and probably what's happened, I mean, there's lots of things that have happened over that time and it's easy to look back and, and, say, and say, but yeah, when there's a new one become available because there's a resistance to the other one, it's kind of been, we've created this kind of arms race. And what we've kind of done is kind of come towards the latter end of the arm race when we start to scratch ahead and going, okay, we've done that. Now what do we do? Because we've burned through them quite quick. So, yeah, I mean, the, this, this will be, when, when they're digging, when they're digging up, if, we, if, human, if humans are still alive and several hundred years or thousand years and we're digging up things this will be known as the antimicrobial era i would imagine because i think we're gonna we're gonna come through it and then it's gonna stop and then we're gonna work have to work out what's next but it, it is one solution better diagnosis i mean I, I mean you would love to be able to turn up to the doctor get you know a swab or something and within five minutes know that you've got some bacteria that has this resistance gene you know if we were at that point then the administration of antimicrobials we'd be able to give the right antimicrobial for the right disease at the minute it's very it's, it's just often quite it's a bit of guesswork isn't it caroline i mean certainly if somebody turns up they sort of often they just start administering these antimicrobials before they even know what they've got yes i mean a good diagnosis is important but i'm just wondering about the volumes used in healthcare versus other industries i mean they use as growth promoters in uh, in agriculture, you know, for farm animals. So, I mean, will reducing that those small volumes really have a big impact? I think it's important for, for health outcomes. Um, having a, a good, an accurate, and quick diagnosis is, is really important. But I'm just wondering, in terms of the sheer volumes used, whether that's just not mm, isn't that being outlawed? And there's some countries don't do that now. I can't remember yeah, if the UK, UK do it. UK doesn't do it, but but still, uh, around the world, I think it's you know, signal signals better than me. Mm. But yeah, it's been outlawed in lots of places, but not wholly. And actually, most it, it, even in places where technically it's outlawed, i.e., it's 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 illegal to do so, it still happens. I mean, I I went to a I went to a farm once in a particular location in Southeast Asia. And they were spraying gentamicin on on tomatoes. <laughs> I mean, and what is, what is that gentamicin? Scene? Is kind of a fairly kind of hardcore antimicrobial that you get that's injectable, right? So you, if you if you were pretty sick in the UK, um, then you'd be you know you'd be you'd, you'd you'd have to be fairly ill to get injectable gentamicin in the hospital. And they were spraying it on tomatoes. It, the, the you know the deal is just this kind of slightly indiscriminate use in, in humans often because it's it's straightforward. They're so cheap. But actually, yeah, the other diagnostic tests are great, but antibiotics are so cheap that actually it's just easier often to give an antibiotic because it's so cheap. And they're so cheap that actually they've been used everywhere and they've been used as growth promoters. Uh, they used to prevent infections in animals. They used to treat infections in animals in the same way they're on humans without a diagnostic test. And also, evidently, they're also sprayed on tomatoes. So we've kind of, you know, we have kind of abused them. OK, pause. Antimicrobials? I thought this episode was about infectious diseases. It is, but antimicrobials are a key part of the conversation. They're small chemicals that kill the microorganisms and bacteria which might cause various infectious diseases. We've been using them for the last 60 to 70 years. Antibiotic, however, just means anti-life, and an antibiotic is a naturally occurring chemical that is produced by organisms to kill other organisms. A classic antibiotic, penicillin, was derived from a fungus. The fungus used the penicillin to outcompete and kill off everything else around it, ensuring its own survival. Like some sort of mushroom Rambo engaged in chemical warfare with its toadstool enemies. And bacteria, as part of the natural evolutionary process, have become resistant to antimicrobials, which means that the chemicals that are designed to kill them no longer kill them. We call this antimicrobial resistance. We've known about this antimicrobial resistance arms race for a long time, but it's become more of a talking point in recent years, which is a good thing. Antimicrobial resistance develops in two ways. It can either evolve naturally through exposure or can be acquired through the swapping of genetic information. The first way looks like this. 
Imagine taking some small amount of a particular chemical that's designed to kill a particular bacteria, and then growing the bacteria in the presence of that chemical. Over a period of time, you will inevitably find that the bacteria develops such that the effect of that drug is not as great as it once was. In short, the drug doesn't kill as much of the bacteria as it once did. And if you repeat the experiment with the same bacteria, increasing the concentration of the drug, you can then stimulate relatively high levels of resistance to that drug. Basically, you've increased the bacteria's tolerance for the drug. Maybe a little bit like how a child might develop a tolerance for, say, Brussels sprouts. First, you cunningly hide some in an ice cream, mint choc chip, for example, camouflage. This gets them used to the presence of sprouts. You slowly increase the quantity of sprouts running through their everyday food, and then in a couple of years, boom, you find they're eating sprouts off the vine. The other way that antimicrobial resistance develops is through the sharing of genetic information. Basically, bacteria have sex and therefore swap their genetic information with one another. Can you imagine Tinder for bacteria, swiping right with their flagella? I'm telling you he didn't look anything like his photo, single-celled my foot. So what are the consequences of widespread antimicrobial resistance? Um, pretty bad to be honest. As Ian points out, antimicrobial resistance is probably the single greatest threat to human health, and he thinks we are massively underestimating the impact it's going to have. I'm almost sorry I asked. It isn't so much the threat of a new virus. Are you thinking COVID? I'm thinking COVID. Instead, it's the threat of a general increase in antimicrobial resistance of those common bacteria that we encounter regularly, particularly for people who already have a weakened immune system. In case this hasn't quite sunk in, what Ian is saying is that without antibiotics, we're back to the sort of interventions we thought we left behind with the First World War such as amputating someone's limb as a means of fighting an infection. Although to be clear, we aren't there yet. Where are we then? How big an issue is antimicrobial resistance at the moment? Steve said that we do have an idea of the size of the problem, but we don't know is the scale of the mortality, so cause of death at scale, and morbidity, the rate of disease in a population. Apparently, one thing that's common to infectious diseases is being underprepared where we, the humans, are underprepared, not the diseases, who in fact have excellent time management and organisational skills. You should just see their Gantt charts. Caroline added that the pandemic has shown that people tend to underestimate the value of early action, with a knock-on effect that you then have to take much more drastic action later on. Turns out there was an elephant in the room, an elephant made up from a very large amount of drug-resistant biomass. Yep. Steve highlighted just how much biomass there is out there, which is already drug resistant. What we tend to see and tend to think of when we think about antimicrobial resistance, such as people coming into hospital with an infection we can't treat, is only the tip of the iceberg. He told us a horror story about taking stool samples from healthy children in Asia cultivating the bacteria in the stool and finding that a whopping 90% of the bacteria would be resistant to all of the antimicrobials we might use in a hospital. 90% guys! That is one terrifying elephant iceberg. Steve argues that this is why we really need to start thinking about new solutions, because if we only rely on our current technologies, then we're not going to get very far. And it was in this context that Ian asked about antimicrobial resistance and the overuse of antibiotics, which led us to something called the microbiome. Oh yeah, I was going to mention that. Sounds sort of cute. Not sure about cute. The human microbiome is the aggregate of all the organisms that reside on or within human tissues. Basically, humans are colonised by a vast number of microorganisms. So many, in fact, that there are very approximately, to the same order of magnitude, the same number of non-human cells as human cells. Okay, fair enough. Not so cute. Some microorganisms that colonise humans are either commensal, symbiotic, or pathogenic. Basically, they either keep themselves to themselves, share and play well with others, or try to poison us. The reason why all of this is important is that your microbiome never really recovers once you've received an antibiotic. It's almost like antibiotics leave permanent scars on the organisms in your gut. 
And where we have widespread overuse of antibiotics, we find a totally different makeup of the microbial communities in those people with lots of resistant genes. Yeah, heavy eyeshadow, bright red lippy, lots of blusher. Steve basically compared antimicrobials to the atomic bomb going off in your gut. Ian, however, pointed out that we don't really have a full picture of how important the microbiome is yet, and what the long-term effects of antibiotic treatments are. So antimicrobial resistance is definitely a problem, a big problem, especially given how important antimicrobials are to us. Exactly. When future generations are looking back, this period could well be known as the antimicrobial era. But at the moment, we're stuck in this arms race with bacteria. We create new antimicrobials, but resistance is typically reported within only two years of that drug being licensed and used. So the more we use antimicrobials, the more antimicrobial resistance we create. Caroline pointed out that the problem isn't just the overuse of antimicrobials in the healthcare industry. When looked at in terms of pure volume, agriculture is another massive user of antimicrobials, for example, as growth promoters for farm and animals and crops. So, um, forgive me if I've missed it, perhaps, but I, I kind of want to maybe make sure we've had a chance to think about whether or not there is a solution to this in anything in any way. Is there anything that we can do to help mitigate the effects of antimicrobial resistance? You know, because Ian mentioned this is possibly one of the biggest threats to human health in the next couple of decades. Is there anything we can do about that? Or are we just stuffed? I think Car this is a good time for Caroline to tell us about what vaccines can do, because vaccines, yeah, vaccines are probably one of the best tools that we've got, Caroline. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of interest in using vaccines to combat resistance and some evidence that, that they could work. So um, there was a lot of, quite a lot of resistance to one form of uh, meningitis caused by the pneumococcus. Um, vaccines were introduced to prevent um, certain serotypes of the, of the bacteria which cause most disease, but these also happened to be the, the types that were most resistant. And after the introduction of vaccines, the resistance dropped by over 80%, I think. So, so you've got then a, a, a smaller population of resistant bacteria circulating. Um, as well as not having people being ill um, and then needing antibiotics as treatment. So they're the sort of effects that vaccines can have. Um, but vaccines work against specific uh, agents, against specific infections. Um, so it's not a, a, it's an answer to some of them where, where resistance is problematic. It's not, it's not the, the uh, can't be all of the, all of the solution though. Um, typhoid, we mentioned, I think that's a, a very good example of where vaccines can prevent typhoid, um, uh, which is which is drug resistant. Um, but we haven't got uh, vaccines against all. I mean, Shigella is, a, a, I mean, Steve, a, there are other examples of vaccines that are in development and potentially very useful. Um, but, but remembering that vaccines are very targeted, so can't cover the whole problem. You said Shigella there. I, I must have missed that. What What's that one? Shigella, Shigella is a, a bacteria that causes a really unpleasant diarrhea in children in, in, in low and middle income countries generally. And that's hugely resistant. So the, the bacteria, I spent, I spent the last 10 years studying it and how it becomes resistant to all different classes of antimicrobials. And there isn't yet a vaccine for it. Uh, and that's one of the big things that we think that maybe having a vaccine that prevents against all different types of diarrheal diseases, including bacteria and viruses, will have a big impact on AMR. And that's probably true. The problem is, as I alluded to earlier, is the kind of slight atomic from approach of the way antimicrobials work. So if you've got a vaccine which prevents you from having diarrhea from a range of different things, it means you're unlikely to take, or less likely, I should say, to take an antimicrobial for diarrhea. But if you get a respiratory tract infection, you will then possibly still take an antimicrobial and that will still have the same effect on whatever's in your gut. So. I think the vaccines are a great way of preventing disease. And if you reduce the amount of disease generally, you're less likely to take antimicrobials overall is the theory. But we don't know, to be honest, what that cumulative effect is, whether it's one dose, two dose, whether it's been exposed to it every year, two years, five years, we've got no idea because we've never really looked before. I was just going to add to that and say, that, you know, there's been some attempts to try to reinforce key messages about the use of antibiotics. You know, I think 
certainly when I was a kid, you know, you'd take a bo- you'd take the antibiotic until you, you, you felt a bit better and then you forget about it. You know, antibiotics need to be taken for the full course. Uh, well, otherwise they don't... Do, well, we don't know. Actually, we don't know that, to be honest. There's no real really? good empirical... No, there's no good empirical evidence to suggest that's the case. It's actually... The, the, but the, logic would suggest that if it, if it's only reduced the bacterial load to a certain level, then you take the selective pressure off. What happens is you can well, get a rebound, surely. Well, we don't know because it, yeah, we can do that in the lab. But what's really in, oh, this is a great hmm. this is great because we don't really know. So actually, all this stuff about completing the course of antimicrobials, I think we should because we you know that's what we're recommended to do. But uh, this is something of uh, some basic research really that needs to be done on thinking whether we need to take a massive single dose compared to a maybe a prolonged lower dose and which has mm. the, the best clinical outcome and which has the best impact on AMR because I don't think we know. I think there's some studies published, but the, the data is a little bit dubious and probably we need to think about how we then use them, whether it's better just to try and have a go at everything in one go or whether to do it long term. I don't think we know. But I think making sure people know that antibiotics don't do anything against viruses, you know, that, I think that's a problem, you know, just generally getting that message out that, there are times when you really should take them and there are times when they really have no no use and to expect the, the GP to prescribe it an antibiotic just because you turn up with some illness is it's just not, it's not can, right. can I ask here um, a question which might just clear some things up I guess because I'd like to understand the distinction between um, sort of you know a disease that we're talking about the the thing which causes that which I guess could be bacteria or a virus the role that an antibiotic might play, but then also how vaccines come into that. Because, I mean, our most recent experience with a vaccine is a vaccine against a viral infection, against COVID. Can we have, you know, do we have vaccines against bacterial infections? I guess we do, but like, how does that all piece together? So these are the different things. I've got these infectious diseases, um, bacteria, viruses, vaccines, etc. So we, we do have some bacterial vaccines, but we have a lot more viral vaccines. The, the reason for that is um, that viruses, the way they work with cells is, in, is incredibly complicated, but viruses themselves, the way they're structured is generally quite simple. Um, so they only have kind of one or two bits that they can show the immune system. And if you can generate response against those, then you can trigger some type of protective response from a vaccine. Bacteria have hundreds of things on their surface, and um, the way they interact with cells is often equally as complicated as viruses, but there's so many different components to it because they're a lot lot bigger, then we don't really know for lots of things how we trigger the same protective response. So we have some bacterial vaccines, some have been around for a long time and are very famous, such as tetanus, tetanus, tox, you know, tet- tetanus toxoid, diphtheria toxoid, Caroline mentioned ty- typhoid, we have some some um, vaccines for, for meningitis, but for other things, for, for things that cause diarrhea, we have very few because we don't really understand how to protect against those. Um, so that's a problem. So they work differently. Um, so that's really, again, something that's really worth us investigating too, how we can develop better vaccines for a whole host of different things. And I think that the, the one thing that is worth saying is probably, I mean, I'll probably speak for Ian and Caroline perhaps as well. If, if not, they can correct me. Probably, if there is something that's good, good come out of the pandemic, which you know there's not a lot of positives, but it would probably be the the introduction of new virus, the new kind of vector platforms for vaccines. I think probably mRNA is probably the most exciting technological breakthrough response to vaccines for, for some time, and that has pro- potentially the you know the real ability to change the game for the way we develop new vaccines for all types of things. Could I ask Caroline maybe a couple more questions about vaccines? So on the one hand, is there anything that determines, is there a rule of thumb whether or not a vaccine can be used to prevent a disease? Um, And what are the big vaccine preventable diseases that are currently causing ill health? That's a good question. Um, So uh, there are vaccines against the major pathogens, I guess. Um, So the, the, the bacteria and viruses that cause most disease um, generally have a vaccine, except for when the interaction between the cells, as Steve's just described, is really complicated. So there's no, there's no HIV vaccine. We've only just, after many, many decades, got to the point where there's a licensed malaria vaccine, um, which kills hundreds of thousands of, of children every year. Um, so, so people are interested in making vaccines against 
um, bacteria and viruses and parasites that cause most disease. Um, from then, uh, you need once you have a vaccine, you need to decide whether, uh, where, and when to use it. Um, so you can have vaccines used in routine childhood programs, um, the diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, polio. Uh, we've, we've mentioned you can have um, vaccines given to teenagers. There are meningitis vaccines given to teenagers in the UK, um, and vaccines given to elderly people, um, like shingles, different shingles, um, flu. Um, and of course, COVID, uh, it, COVID vaccines being used for all adults. So um, the ability to make a vaccine uh, is, is, is important um, and you will be interested in making vaccines against diseases that cause a lot of uh, illness, ill health and, and death. Um, and then the third component is the getting access to vaccines. So um, there's been a lot of debate about vaccine hesitancy, but actually um, I think a bigger problem is, is making sure that children are able to have their routine immunizations. Um, since 2000, Gabby, the, the Vaccine Alliance has, has done a brilliant job in supporting um, access to vaccines in low-income countries. Um, and I think now it's about 86% of children globally get their, get their basic immunizations. Um, but there's still a long way, a long way to go um, uh, in improving access and in, ensuring equitable access. There's been lots of arguments about COVID, about uh, ensuring that low-income countries can have access to COVID vaccines. And despite the early promises, you know, that, that hasn't come to pass. Rich countries have been hoarding, <laughs> hoarding the vaccines um, and it's still problematic getting good, equitable global access. Can, can I just add a comment on your initial question about, you know, what, what decides, is there any rules of thumb that determine whether we can or cannot make a vaccine? I mean, as Steve and Caroline just said, you know, viruses tend not to change the proteins on the surface that much that rapidly, um, but some do. So, for example, we can make a vaccine quite effectively to polio because there's only three different serotypes. But for rhinovirus, which is a very, very similar virus, it causes, uh, you know, the common cold. We can't make a vaccine because it changes these proteins much too fast. It rapidly changes them. So I think having something that doesn't change its antigenicity or the you know the the proteins that the immune system sees uh, it's kind of quite important because you know some some bacteria can just flip and flop they just change so rapidly um some viruses just you know within a period of a few months of circulating in the population can change very rapidly but other viruses can't so i think having you know in order to have an effective vaccine, you need you probably need something that doesn't really antigenically evolve too rapidly. Otherwise, um, you're sort of you're constantly playing catch up. The exception to that might be flu, for example. Flu does change, but we can we it doesn't change. We can ca play catch up. We can make a vaccine that does give some protection. So that would just be one comment. It's worth it's worth saying as well, which is quite which I think is quite cool, but also quite scary is we've got some vaccines that work very well. We don't really understand how they work. I think that's um, a lot of them. I think it's a lot of them. Which, been developed which, empirically. Is, which is remarkable. Yeah, been developed yeah. empirically. Which is remarkable. Without, with evidence that they work, but without a good understanding of, of, of how they work. Um, I was having a conversation the other day that vaccines have done more for immunology than immunology <laughs> has done for vaccines. Yeah. Um, that will be, be popular, you saying that at Cambridge. I hope you broadcast that. <laughs> Ian, um, you worked on Ebola virus. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience working on Ebola? Um, because a few years ago, it was a big scare that we were all talking about, uh, thinking about vaccines. Where are we with vaccines? Is it possible to have a vaccine for Ebola? Well, it, it is possible to have a vaccine to Ebola. And I think um, there are, uh, I don't know if they've been approved, but certainly for epidemic response now, I think one of the first things they're able to do is they, when an outbreak occurs, what will happen is they will do a sort of ring vaccination whereby they go in and vaccinate anybody in the area who might come into contact and that enables you to 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 restrict the spread of the virus. But in fairness, you know, Ebola is quite an easy virus to contain because people are sick before they can transmit it. So you can tell when somebody's got Ebola. I mean, it may take you, it, it could be a whole bunch of other things, but there's not very much of an asymptomatic transmission period. So, and it's only transmitted through real person to person contact. So 
when we were working in the treatment center, you know, you could sit one side of a fence and a ball infected individual be sat, you know, and I say fence, it was a piece of tape, was sat, you know, a meter or two the other side and there's there's no risk to you. Um, the problem comes when you've got respiratory viruses and things like that. That That's where the, the, the real issue comes. But, you know, one thing we discovered in, in as part of our work with our colleagues in Birmingham and Edinburgh is a bowl of virus can live inside people for quite some time. So 500 days, we found an individual who had Ebola virus in his semen and then he spread it and then caused another outbreak. And the, one of the most recent outbreaks of Ebola, I think in DRC, was actually linked back to somebody who'd been infected in one of the previous outbreaks. So it's not always the case now that every new Ebola virus outbreak comes from a bat. It could be this re-emerging from somebody who's had a persistent infection. And that, and I think that's really interesting because there's, a, there's recent data that Lassa fever is the same and there's some other viruses that, that it's becoming clear that these long-term persistent infections are more of a problem. So one thing the Ebola epidemic did was make people think more about epidemic preparedness. It may not feel like it, the situation we're in, but, but there were some initiatives that, that were really stimulated by the uh, Ebola, West African Ebola epidemic that, that Ian works, uh, works in Sierra Leone to combat. Um, and one of them is, is CEPI, so a new initiative to develop vaccines against potential future threats. Now, one vaccine on their on their list of of dangerous pathogens was was MERS, a sort of coronavirus. Um, and so there was all this, uh, if you like, infrastructure to ready to to make new vaccines. There was also a lot of infrastructure around as a blueprint for doing trials in epidemic situations. And people were already thinking about this, and that really helped set things like the recovery trial for COVID up. Um, because the Ebola made people think a bit more about how do we how do we deal better with infectious diseases. So I think these are two really uh, good examples of where we did have a bit of forethought um, preparation, um, both in terms of being able to evaluate uh, new uh, therapeutics um, and and develop new vaccines. And Ian, if I understand some of the work that you did around Ebola was about rapid diagnosis and then rapid genetic sequencing. Why are both of those important? Well, yeah, you're, you're right. So we initially went there just to, as a volunteer. I went as a volunteer to set up a diagnostic lab. And the aim was really, you know, if you can diagnose somebody as having Ebola or something else, then you can either get them in at a treatment center and isolate them or get them back into community because there was a lot of people being put into treatment centers who didn't have Ebola and then they would catch it in the treatment center, you know. So I think the rapid diagnosis was really important. The sequencing was something that, you know, we knew was important. I mean, it's interesting because it was not really an area that I worked in at the time. It was just something I happened to find myself in a in Sierra Leone and we identified that we could probably benefit from having rapid surveillance of of the virus, understand how the virus was evolving. But it turned out to be really important because near the end of the epidemic, we were getting lots of cases and we had no idea where they were coming from. So, you know, we had a bit of the country where we worked. But we had no cases for like four or five months. And then all of a sudden, like two people turn up dead, test with Ebola. And like, well, where did this thing come from? So it can either, it can be a new spillover from a bat for an animal reservoir. It could be that actually there's part of the community who are just not coming forward for testing. And there's like a hundred or so people in the community who've had it and we've just missed them. And that's a real problem. Or they picked it up because of some sort of contact with somebody else. And by looking at the genetic sequence of the virus and the, and the mutations that the viral genome had, you could, with a certain degree of confidence, play you know figure out where they may have got it from and we worked with a team in Birmingham and Edinburgh to do this and in that instance we could clearly see that this person had traveled from the capital got infected in the capital and brought it even though they didn't really admit that that's what had happened but the, the one following on from what Caroline said in terms of preparedness you know the one thing that came of that was that myself 
colleagues, Birmingham and Edinburgh, got together and we got funding from the Wellcome Trust to really think about how one can use rapid sequencing in epidemic response. And that's been really important for COVID because we developed, or the team in Birmingham developed some sequencing protocols that were really instrumental. I mean, we'd estimate that more than 50% of all the COVID sequences across the world have been done using the protocols that we did develop by this collaborative network called Arctic. Um, and, we're, and we're part of that. So that really was really enabling, you know, and... And, uh, and that, that sequencing is what, helps us identify the particular strain of COVID at the moment. Is that right? We were part of a national consortium called COG UK, led by Sharon Peacock here in Cambridge. And it's fair to say that we knew that sequencing COVID could probably be important back in at the start of the epidemic, but we didn't, probably most of us didn't really understand, you know, we had no idea how this virus was going to evolve, really. Um, it's only since all these new variants have started to pop up and we've started to see that... Um, the virus is evolving away from herd immunity or immune responses, that the real importance to uh, the real value of sequence become apparent. So it's a bit futur futuritous, but, you know, we started in March, everybody knew there was value in it. Um, and since then, it's become really important. And I think globally, you know, it's one thing I think the UK did well was to get going, start sequencing these viruses early on. I think I think the, the killer the killer question is really now we've had this pandemic, what happens if this happens again in ten years? Are we in a better position now to deal with this when it happens next time? Can we predict when it happens next time? And if it does happen next time, will we deal with it any differently? Well, well don't I, ask I, mean, me. I think you you posed <laughs> you the question. question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. That's I'm, I'm throwing that one to Caroline or or Ian. <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what Caroline says about it. So I'll, I'm happy to make give my own opinion, but uh, I'll let you answer first, Caroline. As I said, I think I think we've learned quite a lot from the Ebola experience um, about preparedness. Um, I think we'll learn even a lot more about uh, from COVID and this pandemic. Um, so we've got some good tools. We've got the ability to make new vaccines and make new vaccines really quickly. That, I mean, that was the game changer. Making making the vaccines within a year of identifying uh, the virus it was really quite incredible. Um, it depends on what the next uh, threat is going to be, whether it's possible to make them that quickly. You need to be able to find the, the target, um, the part of the virus or bacteria that your immune response, uh, your immune system can respond to. Um, but but you know we have we have these great tools, vaccines for, for prevention. Um, we have, uh, Ian talked about the, the sequencing capacity. Again, that's another thing the UK did, did really well in understanding more about the, the spread of, of infection and new strains that were emerging through the use of, of uh, genome sequencing. So that's another important tool. The, the, the ability to do trials quickly to look for new therapeutics. Um, again, we can take, we can take that forward. Um, what tends to be forgotten about are the, are the sort of less, less sexy things like ongoing surveillance, ongoing public health capacity. And these things tend to go in cycles. When I started um, my PhD, uh, the Health Protection Agency was just being formed, um, really driven by uh, the potential of bioterrorism um, and uh, an avian flu, avian influenza pandemic that everyone's expecting. Now, neither of those things uh, happened. <laughs> we got, it was eventually a swine flu pandemic. And, and sort of interest waned and, and, and money wanes. Um, and actually, I think the public health capacity of, of the UK has been, has been eroded a lot over the past few decades. Um, so that, they're the things we, we shouldn't forget about. I think the science has done well, but we need to have that, um, the ability to respond through having a good infrastructure, uh, good human resources. And, and I hope that that, that doesn't get forgotten about. I think I mentioned we're not very good at thinking about the potential catastrophic risks, um, these one in a hundred year events, or, you know, maybe it's less frequent or more frequent than that, but, but what we need these systems in place for the, are for these rare, <laughs> rare events, which when they happen can be, can be catastrophic. Um, and I hope that doesn't get for, forgotten as we move away from this pandemic. We've got some, certainly got some good tools. I think we probably need better politics and better global cooperation. The example of the, the, uh, lack of access to vaccines in low-income countries is, is really tragic when, when we have the tools to, to uh, prevent COVID around the world. 
I think that the problem is when there's when there's you know in between these sorts of events, people lose interest. They don't want to fund, you know, surveillance because it's kind of seen as boring, but it's so important. And you know, using the sequencing as an example, the the reason the UK did so well is because it, it actually a lot of it fell on academic laboratories, research laboratories, and since then, you know. The public health laboratories have tried to come in and pick up some of this skill set, but they didn't. You know, some laboratories had that skill set, but many don't, and the, the infrastructure really isn't isn't there. I think the, the in terms of predicting what's going to happen in the future, I don't know. If we can. I don't know if it'd be easy to sit here and go, okay, the next pandemic is going to come from Nipah virus, or it's going to be a coronavirus, or something like that. I think. One that just needs to recognise that these things were a threat and put things in place that enables us to respond to them effectively. As Caroline said, you know, the UK has done really well at running clinical trials. I mean, absolutely fantastic work from Peter Horby's lab and, and the likes, to setting up those clinical trials and running them effectively. Um, sequencing is one thing. The vaccine's been brilliant. But, you know, there's a reason why... That the UK had very few, if any, coronavirologists, okay? And that's because it was not seen as worthy of funding. So, you know, funding agencies tend to think, well, you know, we're going to fund work on this virus because this is important. Actually, you know, all, all infectious agents are important. I think having a base level of knowledge about coronaviruses, which, you know, we did have to a degree, would be incredibly useful. So thinking about where you're investing those resources is really important going forward. So a more a more open mind to what the potential threats are. We can do a good a sort of good scan of where what the threats are. We'll probably get it wrong. I mean, people were expecting avian flu from from Asia, and they got swine flu from Mexico. Um, so we'll probably get it wrong. But having a more open mind and a broader perspective of where the potential threats are, I think, will be really helpful. It's worth saying if this had happened twenty years ago, we wouldn't be in this position now. So, so, so I, so, I, so, I, can we predict what's going when it, when the next thing is going to come and what it is? No, is it going to happen? Yes. Are we better prepared for it? Well, yes and no because those things limit what we can actually do. But if this had happened twenty years ago, we don't have any of the same pipelines for drug development. We don't have any of the same pipelines for vaccine development. Genome sequencing in in its extent that we use it now didn't exist. So. You know, we've got the tools and the technology, so we're better positioned to respond to it. The problem that's limiting that is the startup time for when it comes, because we can't simply be ready for when it occurs, because we don't know when it's going to be. Finally, some solutions to the problem of antimicrobial resistance. Yes, and it's vaccines to the rescue. Caroline explained how there's a lot of interest in using vaccines to combat antimicrobial resistance and some evidence that they could work. Vaccines work against specific agents, against specific infections, and so it's not an answer to every form of antimicrobial resistance. But think about it this way. If you reduce the amount of disease, you're less likely to need antimicrobials. Steve told us about Shigella. Not exactly a pleasant name, Shigella. Probably best to avoid. Shigella is a bacteria that causes really unpleasant diarrhoea in children in lower to middle income countries. Sadly, it's hugely resistant to antimicrobials and there isn't yet a vaccine for it. But Steve is interested in developing a vaccine that prevents all different types of diarrheal diseases, including those caused by both bacteria and viruses. The hope is that this will have a big impact on antimicrobial resistance. As if you've got a vaccine which prevents you from getting diarrhea from a range of different things, it means you're less likely to need to press the nuclear button and take an antimicrobial. That's the aim. I'm sure your microbiome would be very grateful if it works. Did we get any answers to the age-old antibiotics question, full dose or not to full dose? Well, that is the question. Ian opened a can of worms with this question because apparently we don't actually know whether you should take a full course of antibiotics or not. To be clear, Steve pointed out that we definitely should take a full course because that's what we're recommended to do by medical professionals. His point is that there's no empirical evidence to suggest that we need to take a full dose. Which just highlights the fact that some research really needs to be done on this. 
we need answers to questions such as, do we need to take a larger single dose or a prolonged lower dose? Which has the best clinical outcome? And which has the best impact on antimicrobial resistance? And what did we learn about vaccines more broadly? Well, firstly, we learned that there are both bacterial and viral vaccines. Which is a good moment for a public service announcement. Antibiotics do not, repeat, do not help against viral infections. Thanks for that. Bacterial vaccines include those we get to protect us against things like tetanus, typhoid and meningitis. Tetanus being the thing that rusty nails and hamsters can give you. Other things too, I'm sure. We actually have quite a few bacterial vaccines, but we have fewer viral vaccines and don't understand as well how to protect against viral infections. It's something that needs exploring. Did I hear that some good has come out of the pandemic in this respect? You don't get to say that too often. Absolutely. Steve says that mRNA, the technology used to create the Pfizer COVID vaccines, is probably the most exciting technological breakthrough in vaccine development for some time. It has the potential to be a real game changer when it comes to the way that new vaccines are developed. But even once you have a vaccine, like we do now for malaria, a disease which kills hundreds of thousands of children every year, even though it took decades to develop, rolling out the vaccine isn't necessarily easy. You need to decide where and when to use it. Options include routine childhood vaccination programs, such as for tetanus, dysteria and polio. Some vaccines can instead be given to teenagers, there are a few like that in the UK, or to the elderly. It sounds like making sure that the children get their routine vaccinations is one of the best things we can do once vaccines are available, however. Did we learn anything about making vaccines? Why is it so difficult? Well, Ian pointed out that in order to have an effective vaccine, you ideally want some target virus or bacteria that doesn't really evolve too rapidly, as you're constantly playing catch up. Some viruses can change rapidly, especially if they're circulating in the population. Steve and Caroline also pointed out that we have some vaccines that work very well, but we don't really understand how they work. Who'd let a lack of understanding hold a good vaccine back? The example of Ebola came up, which is a virus Ian has worked with. There isn't an improved vaccine for Ebola apart from a vaccine for epidemic response. However, the interesting thing about Ebola is that it can live inside people for quite some time, so new outbreaks can emerge from a previous patient. Ian mentioned the example of someone who caused an outbreak a whopping 500 days after their initial infection. I can barely keep a plant alive for that long. So when there's an Ebola outbreak, those responding typically perform a ring vaccination, where they vaccinate everyone in the area who might come into contact with the patient, therefore restricting the spread. This makes Ebola relatively easy to contain. It's also made easier by the fact that people usually get sick with Ebola before they have a chance to transmit the virus, which unlike Covid, say, is only transmitted via person-to-person -person contact. Caroline made the point that the, the last Ebola outbreak was a real eye-opener, and it got people thinking about the epidemic preparedness, both in terms of being able to evaluate new therapeutics and develop new vaccines. Caroline also mentioned CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, which is a new initiative to develop vaccines against potential future threats. Launched in 2017, CEPI's goal is to stop future epidemics. One of the things we can do next time there is something which looks like it might have the potential to become the next COVID is to deploy rapid diagnosis and rapid genetic sequencing. And so what happens if there's another pandemic in, say, another 10 years' time? Are we in a better position now to deal with this next time? Can we predict when it might happen? And if it does happen, will we deal with it any differently? Ugh, the idea of another pandemic is utterly miserable. Well, Caroline pointed out that it depends on what the next threat is going to be. We now have great tools, sequencing, vaccines, and the capability to understand the spread. But what tends to be forgotten are the other sort of less sexy things like ongoing surveillance, ongoing public health capacity, and the fact that these things tend to go in cycles. Sounds like we need to make public health capacity sexy again. Swipe right on the NHS, guys. 
thinking about like the lessons learned and you know thinking about preparedness and what we've sort of experienced over the last two years and lessons from Ebola and so forth and sequencing and is what is going to happen and how do we make help countries you know thinking this is a global problem how are we going to sort of help countries sort of create skills share skills networks information how is that how is that going to happen going forward i think this is where the the initiatives that caroline and and, and steve come in really you know it's it's trying to leverage the skill the skill sets we have here in cambridge and through our collaborative networks to help support our partners in other countries to to develop and maintain those skill sets so you know we have a funding from the welcome trust recently to set up a support covid sequencing in west and central africa and whilst the funding comes from the welcome trust to cambridge the vast pretty much let's say 90 percent of it or more goes to the laboratories in west africa and central africa to really support them and we're just here as a uh, to provide remote support but it's probably worth steve and caroline speaking specifically with the ci3 and cambridge africa because they're really flagship programs where you know cambridge is really leveraging its its uh, you know its academic community to support the, the, the the global efforts in this space i think this is something we all feel very kind of strongly about the way um science i was going to say traditionally works but the way science does work is, is often very much around individuals and these often or always these individuals are based in europe or the us generally um and for the the lots of things that we're interested in with the impact on diseases that are circulating more in low middle income countries um the kind of scientific strength is here in the west or the the north as it's referred to often um and i think that we we see a you know an opportunity for for cambridge and, and hopefully more broader than cambridge to be honest i don't i don't see it specifically focused around an individual university i don't think we need to claim anything but it would be great if we could then use the resources and skills and equipment and expertise that we have here uh, to train and develop the next generation of scientists working in places where these things are a problem and i think that's something we're trying to set up with this cr3 initiative but it's also something that caroline can talk about with her, her kind of vast experience of working through Cambridge Africa as well. Let's let's hear about CI3 a little bit first. So that's the Cambridge International Infection Initiative. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, Caroline, I'd love to hear about Cambridge Africa. Yeah, so this is this is new. Um, we're just really getting off the ground working on how we kind of set our stall out. And it's it set around the model of, yeah, as I, as I suggested, of having people come and work with us use our facilities and then we create a kind of alumni system that people coming and doing projects with us. Um, we're, we're already doing it um, unofficially. We have, I, I have a PhD student in my lab from Bangladesh, I have someone from India. We, Ian has international PhD students, so does Caroline through Cambridge Africa. I think it's a mechanism for us to maybe formalize it a little bit more within the university and try and bring more people in because there is a lot of uh, in, untapped skill in this particular space that probably we could do better at within the university more broadly uh, and have some impact on 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 using these resources to train train people so um we have some we have some money we have some uh, funding to get going i'm running a project that's similar to what ian's doing so my interest is in typhoid fever uh, i have a grant from the gates foundation uh, to set up a sequencing capacity uh, in pakistan to do typhoid sequencing the the kind of epicenter of these extensive drug resistant organisms they've just introduced immunization for everybody so it's an opportunity really for us to work with them to develop the capacity not only to do the sequencing but also understand what happens to the bacteria when we've immunized um, a large portion of the population and that really then hopefully will become a platform to do other things uh, interaction with ecologies is going to be key but also reaching out to our colleagues across the different departments this isn't focused on the department of medicine or the department of pathology or the vet school we hope that it's going to be more broad and we can bring in people from all the way across the university to try and get engaged. Yeah, so Steve talked about this International Infection Initiative, um, which sort of builds on some of Cambridge Africa's work. Um, Cambridge Africa has been going since 2008 uh, to support Africa researchers actually across a whole range of subjects, not just infectious diseases. Um, and, you know, the, 
so the, we work, we support students to come to Cambridge to do their PhDs, we support students who are in Africa doing their PhDs, um, just setting them up with, with mentors and, uh, and advisors here in Cambridge and, and visits to Cambridge. Um, we give small grants uh, to pairs of African and, and Cambridge researchers to, to help build their collaborations. And um, the programme has been, been really successful. Uh, the seed funds have, have gone on to, to, to uh, people who've been awarded those have gone on to win much bigger grants and, and some really great collaborations and partnerships have, have come out of this. And I think one of the reasons why it works um, is because of this two-way learning. It's not just Cambridge sharing their knowledge with the world. Um, it's the African researchers and students sharing their knowledge back with us and giving us new ideas and, and it's really stimulating and that's why it's work. It's, it's not it's not because it's an altruistic program, it's, it's genuinely uh, two way and creates lots of interest and excitement on, on both sides and um, you know we look forward to working with CI3 um, to, to, to build on, on our previous experience of Cambridge Africa. There's something we haven't talked about at all in this, it's like what is the link to climate change and global infectious diseases going forward? It certainly is a link. I'm not sure we fully understand it at the moment. I mean, thinking about my own research, um, you get epidemics of meningitis in this area known as the African meningitis belt, sort of runs from Senegal across to Ethiopia. And that, that region is sort of defined by these dry, dusty winds, low humidity, um, uh, other things like population density play a role. But, but as the we know it's linked to climate. We're not very good at predicting when epidemics are going to happen based on um, based on the weather or dust levels. But there's definitely this association there. And what we're already seeing is that some areas that were uh, traditionally outside of this belt, this high risk area, um, are now being included. So in Ghana, there have been outbreaks of meningitis further south than we would traditionally see. Um, and we, we're interested in uh, in looking to see whether that might be a consequence of, of climate change. Um, but we would expect climate to affect, affect many other infectious diseases, um, including vector-borne diseases uh, like dengue and malaria. So like, um, any of us here are particular experts in, but, but certainly as, as climate changes, um, we will see shifts in infectious disease burdens and, and threats. So the, as Caroline was saying, you know, the as we see change in climate, the the insects and rodents and ticks that harbor many of these sort of highly pathogenic viruses that are sometimes spill over into the human population their, their geographical distribution changes um and that, that, that you know people are encountering certain types of insects that they would not necessarily but i i also wonder how much of Climate change is going to affect bird migration. You know, bird, the migratory birds are a huge problem when it comes to movement of certain types of infectious diseases around the globe. And I don't know enough about it, but one might imagine that uh, if the UK became nice and hot, you know, I might see all kinds of crazy exotic birds out the front of my house here that wouldn't normally be here that might then bring with them infectious agents and the thing is they would then move into the domestic uh, or the more localized bird population and then you end up with some sort of west nile virus in cambridge or something crazy i i, I don't think that's going to happen but you know those are the sorts of scenarios i think we need to we need to think about well they, these things are all intrinsically linked with kind of pandemics as well so we know that destruction of the natural environments encroachments and things are more likely so it's not just the impact of climate change, but it's also other impacts of what we're doing as we kind of destroy natural areas. Um, access to pro food, protein, as things become more scarce is an issue. With diarrheal diseases, I mean, so many low-lying countries in that there's, 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 a, there's a good chance that the places around the Bay of Bengal in Bangladesh and India are, are going to be underwater in 50 years. Um, it's the epicenter of cholera, so cholera is everybody's heard of. There's, there's, there's very few infectious diseases which make you tremor a bit like cholera. It's kind of one of the classical things, but it's still a big problem, particularly in that part of the world. Uh, and it's a bacteria that um, lives in kind of um, brackish water. So as that area then heats up, floods, then we're probably going to see a lot more cholera. It's drug resistant. We have a vaccine for it. 
So I think there's quite a lot of work of understanding what's going to happen to cholera, what's going to happen to AMR with cholera, and what's going to happen to uh, cholera immunization over the next 40 to 50 years on the back of climate change. So I think there's, there's a huge impact of which we probably even haven't even started thinking about scraping the surface off yet. But dengue is a great, well, dengue is a really interesting one. So yeah, dengue spread out. Deng, dengue fever, so it's a virus that spread by uh, Aegis aegypti mosquitoes. It's a, and it's an urban mosquito. So it, it, rather than thinking that it's a risk living in kind of highly kind of um, rural areas, it actually the, the, the virus actually lives uh, the, the the mosquito that spreads the virus lives in kind of um, cities. So it hides in kind of wa water in, in reservoir pots around cities. And as we build more cities and they get they get warmer, then actually we get more and more dengue, which is kind of spread out all over the world. Um, and I've had dengue and it's not very nice. So I think that, you know, if, we, if we're thinking there, there's an encroachment of dengue into southern Europe and we get warmer, then there's a very good chance that we're going to start suffering from some of these mosquito borne infections, of which we're not particularly well prepared. Sounds like you've had quite a few of these diseases, Steve. Yeah. yeah. I've had dengue, I've had malaria, yeah. Personal hygiene's not <laughs> high Personal on Steve's hygiene's not good. agenda, I think. You know, I've, had a load. To... I've, I've never had typhoid or shigella, which is the two I work on, thankfully, and I don't really want to, but I've had plenty of others, yeah. I can give you a hit list of the best. I had Compilobacter once when I worked at another university yeah. that will remain nameless, but that was horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. Yeah, I mean, the... chicken. Well, thankfully, oh. thankfully, you have, thankfully, you haven't had Ebola. I mean, God. I mean, that's probably the worst of the worst, isn't it? So, where are we at the end of that conversation? Well, Ian told us about the importance of leveraging the skills at places like Cambridge and using collaborative networks to help support partners in other countries. It's easy to forget, but turns out we're not the only university out there. Ian mentioned the example of funding from the Wellcome Trust to set up and support COVID sequencing in West and Central Africa. While the funding comes from the Wellcome Trust to Cambridge, around 90% of it ends up going to laboratories in West and Central Africa. Steve also talked about the initiative CI3, the Cambridge International Infection Initiative. Its goal is to develop equitable relationships between Cambridge and international partners working on major infectious disease priorities in low and middle income countries. But Caroline pointed out that the learning isn't only one way, for example, the Cambridge Africa programme not only supports students to come to Cambridge to do their PhDs, but also supports students doing their PhDs in Africa to build their network of collaborators and meet mentors and advisors. And what about climate change? Did I hear correctly that this is also going to be important when it comes to infectious diseases? That's right. Caroline explained how for some diseases, such as dengue and malaria, which are spread by mosquitoes, changes to the local climate can make the environment more hospitable to these insects. In Africa, there's something called the meningitis belt, which is an area that runs from Senegal to Ethiopia. As the name suggests, there's a lot of meningitis in the meningitis belt. But now there are also increasing outbreaks of meningitis further south, in Ghana, likely as a result of climate change and temperature rises Meningitis outbreaks are linked to high temperatures and airborne dust. A bit like the mosquitoes, the insects, rodents and ticks which carry various infectious diseases will tend to distribute themselves across different geography in response to changes in the climate. People then begin to encounter new insects and animals they might not normally, leading to the pathogens carried by those insects, rodents and ticks spilling over into the human population. And if we think about bird flu and the potential for viruses to pass from birds to humans, we have to remember that climate change will also change bird migration patterns. This means that infectious diseases will be moving around the world in new and unexpected ways. And Steve left us with a scary thought, didn't he? Oh, absolutely. He asked us to imagine what might happen if the drug-resistant bacterium which causes cholera were to spread more widely by virtue of the current cholera epicentre, the Bay of Bengal, going underwater due to climate change. And although we might not know what it's like to have some of the various diseases we've mentioned, our guests certainly do. And they weren't afraid to tell us about it. 
looks like we've reached the end of another episode. Stay tuned for our next episode on cancer and AI. Before then, please spread the Mind Over Chatter word. Who do you know whose life is simply incomplete without our voices in their ears? And please fill out our survey to tell us what you think of the podcast. You can find the link to the survey in the episode description. We want it all. The good, the bad and the ugly. And please make sure to leave us a review on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. We like reviews. Hopefully a good one, not a bad one or an ugly one. A huge thanks once again to our guests, Stephen Baker, Ian Goodfellow and Caroline Trotter. And finally, a big thank you to the sickeningly talented Carlo Ladd for our music and the equally talented Alex Sadler for our artwork. See See you next time. time!